Well, note to a particular text in Damascene, that's a very popular one that gets brought up very often, where, where Damascene, uh, St. John Damascene, excuse me, is pointing out, and he says that there is influence upon Muhammad uh, from an Aryan monk. But I think another piece of text that people tend to not um, uh, focus on from Damascene is in another area, he doesn't only focus upon an Aryan monk influence in Muhammad that he claims, but he says that, and I'm reading it, there were particular Jews, Christians, Aryans, and historians. Of course, he's talking about, a, you know, kind of like a mishmash of, of heterodox views that, um, that influenced his, his theology. Now, I, I wonder, um, when it comes to this particular, these particular statements of, of St. John Damascene, um, would he have had any kind of early acquaintance to know these details? How would he have uh, picked up this kind of information? And of course, uh, we, I recognize that within Islamic, in the Islamic studies, it would probably, without a doubt, re uh, reject this from St. John Damascene. In terms of historical value, do his statements have any kind of historical value? Because I've heard people tell me, I say, well, you know what, that's, uh, that's polemical. Uh, he's claiming that Arianism influenced him. And then you look at uh, the teachings of Arianism, and you might find some parallels there, but without a doubt, um, uh, the Quran goes in a different direction in many different fields. Um, but then it does open up even more, and it does make a lot more sense if you read St. John Damascene, not only arguing influence of Arianism, but arguing influence of Nestorianism and, and other areas. And when he does bring up the, uh, the influence of Nestorianism, I am particularly, um, my ears perk up because we know very well that the Quran doesn't uh, portray Mary um, as, a, as mother of God. That would have been something quite um, particular uh, to note Nestorius in, in, at that time in, in church history. So I wonder, do his statements have any kind of historical value? And, and perhaps maybe you can give your thoughts first, Father Coppins, and then Dr. Reynolds, I'd, I'd like, or, or whichever, whoever wants to go first. Uh, I'll, I'll let Dr. Reynolds decide. <laughs> oh, I'll defer to you. Go, go for it, uh, sure. Abuno, please. I, I, I uh, thank you. Uh, I, uh, it's nice we're a Milkite seminary, so I do hear Abuno a lot. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, so um, I, I do put a footnote in that, in the informal uh, document that you have on your patristicpillars.com uh, website. Yeah. And I think something that, that can be missed is that St. Athanasius himself um, tended to use the Arian brush to really be focused on the non-divinity claims of, of, of Jesus' status. So we have to be careful with John in a polemical context calling uh, Bahira an Arian monk, because though he could be taken in the most literal sense that we, we do have evidence of... Um, one of the um, so-called, so I mean, there's arguments about how uh, committed uh, Constantine's so-called Aryan sons were to Arianism versus just being the boss of everybody, right? So um, the, the, the there were some foundations, including Yathrib, of, of, uh, of a uh, Christian church, which would have been under an Aryan emperor. So it's not inconceivable that Arianism in some sense or form survived outside of the Roman Empire as it, it did in many barbarian contexts. But I think um, with John Damascene, there's, there's certainly the nuance there that he could be saying something like a monk who did not acknowledge the divinity of Christ. Um, and um, from what we've seen with the kind of mixing and matching of, of various groups that were blending with one another, it's not always easy to place someone a sect. I mean, you, you go into a, a church or a mosque today and you ask their opinions on just about anything, boy, you're going to get some stories. Um, and miracle stories and visions are probably everybody's favorite. And those probably tend to be the, le the least wed to dog dogma uh, that I've, I've witnessed in literature. They tend to be uh, rather exaggerated and hyperbolic. So, um, I certainly am sympathetic to John Damascene's witness that he, um, in Muslim Christian debates where he has to dialogue with Muslims, he's not finding it uh, unhelpful in dialogues with them to speak about 
we'll call him Bahira, which probably just means a, res, a name of respect for a tested or a tried or approved uh, religious, perhaps even given to priests. Um, but so-called Bahira um, seems to be a point of agreement, at least amongst the dialoguers in the Jerusalem community who are from an Arabic background. That's that's what I would say. Great. Should I jump in there? With... Please, please. Yeah, okay. Thoughts on that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful. So, um, yeah, I would I would agree with everything Father Kappa said, and add add to that, of course, that the text itself is um, that we have of John of Damascus is a compilation of the of the heresies, um, de heresibus, and so um, it's sort of natural that he would. Um, engage with the beliefs of this proto-Islamic community around him in light of um, Christ Christian heresies. Um, so I think that that context is is pretty important. Um, there's also a larger um, sort of a theme or motif of, um, of the Arabs as a people who uh, were sort of helpless on their own, um, lost in lost in you know the most uh, decadent form of uh, paganism idolatry and um, what changed had to have come from the outside so even the notion that they understood themselves to be uh, Ishmaelites or Hagarenes um, I believe it's Josephus already the Jewish historian um, speaks of uh, uh, of Jews um, reminding them of their uh, Abrahamic roots through Ishmael. Uh, this is picked up by later Byzantine Christian historians like Sozomen and Theodoret, I think. So, um, yeah, so that that's sort of a notion. But then uh, I would sort of challenge uh, one aspect of that vision of sort of the Arabs as, you know, these pagan people who um, received uh, heretical influences from the outside. Um, and this is not really a response to anything Father Kappa said because it's sort of a, a new or different point. But um, I, I think that uh, the notion of Arabia as a land where, where heresies could spring up and be received, um, it, it's attractive. It's like it's one of those arguments that like is kind of attractive. Uh, because it just seems natural, like the Byzantine influence had a sort of limit, you know, in the civilized lands. But then you go out into the desert and like anything goes, like you say wild things about God. And, you know, um, I, I just don't see uh, really solid evidence for um, not only Aryans, but other imagined sects that could be behind the, 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 the Quran. Um, and then I, fi a final point is uh, just to affirm something Father Kappa said, which I think is really important, which is, yeah, let's remember that um, uh, how diverse Christian views and, as, as you say, Islamic views are about God in Christ. Um, uh, and so, I mean, today, just to use, you know, a, a Latin rite parish, you know, if you go into my parish here in Indiana and you asked about, you know, who is Jesus, right? boy, you'd get a lot of different mm -hmm. answers. I mean, it's, even if you were specific about like Christology, the divine and the human, how do these go together? What are the natures? You get lots of different answers. You're doing so, pretty well as a monophysite these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, that's not the only uh, heresy that's come back. I think we have Mar <laughs> Marcionites too. And <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I think the same is basically true uh, in late antiquity. Um, and uh, so you don't need a sort of formal uh, community of Aryans uh, or something else, some Judeo-Christian, Jewish Christians to have survived somehow in Arabia to get many different Christological views within Christianity. That, that is a really good point there. Um, and without a doubt, you walk into various parishes, you're gonna um, unfortunately probably get um, a, a number of erroneous views. Now, let me let me kind of um, uh, pose this question for you, then, Dr. Reynolds. From and I, I look at it from, of course, from a perspective of the field of work that I that I do, apologetics. But a, a Catholic apologist or even Orthodox would then um, uh, offer a little bit of pushback, and then they would say, "Okay, 
Well, yeah, we can grant that perhaps uh, on the ground, uh, there are a number of people and there are even um, groups of people that uh, would have held rather unorthodox views on Christology. Uh, but then doesn't that, um, don't we run into problems then with uh, the inspiration of the Quran, with uh, the message that was put forth by Muhammad, when you realize that the Christology he was putting forth, the teachings in Christ, they, send, they tend to run contrary, contra to what was known as Orthodox Christology, what was passed on from the what we would consider the Apostolic Church. Um, what, how would how would a how would a I guess how do I put it? How would a Muslim be able to deal with that? Because we can say, of course, you can run into all kinds of different views, but we realize that these views were deemed heretical. And um, these views were condemned, and by the time of Muhammad, multiple ecumenical councils already um, that dealt specifically with Christology. Isn't that, in my opinion, that from my perspective, you gentlemen know way more Islam than I do, but from my perspective as a, a Christian, I look at it and I say, okay, well, this is still problematic because um, we've got the apostolic church gathering in council after council, even the apostolic fathers closest to the time of Christ, that are teaching th these particular Christological points, and yet you find this these teachings that come from Muhammad to be clearly uh, at variance with that. Um, I, I, I imagine you see the way I would look at it, right? Um, how would how would a, from the Islamic perspective, how would you then answer that? How would that be tackled? It, it, do you at least see that it seems to be a little bit problematic from our point of view? And whoever wants to tackle that, no, please, Doctor Reynolds. Since you're talking about how an Islamic, uh, uh, how Islamic minds uh, in print yeah. and in conversation today would would look at things, yeah, I can I can say a couple of things about that. Um, so uh, I mean, first, maybe just to to preface any comments, um, you know, as I say with with Muslim friends, you know, uh, historical critical research on the Quran, at least from my perspective. Uh, the way that I approach things, um, uh, and you know, with some uh, dabbling in theology, much much less than you, Father Kappas, but just because my <laughs> colleagues around at Notre Dame are theologians, whereas my work is mostly historical. I mean, it just seems to me that the historical work can never really address the question of whether um, the Quran is revealed, Muhammad heard from God. Those are theological questions that are in a whole other realm, right? So. Um, but I mean, I would say from a historical perspective, uh, yeah, there are signs in the Quran that um, uh, the author um, was engaging with uh, the, uh, the the religious world of late antiquity, and um, the way that the figure of Jesus is presented um, is intriguing. Um, and you know, I mean, one interesting point, for example, is the fact that he's still called Messiah. Or Messiah, so this is really interesting. It's probably the maybe the most obvious point to make, but the Quran repeatedly calls him Messiah. It even has the Jews in Quran chapter four, verse one fifty-seven, refer to Jesus as El Messiah um, and the Prophet of God um, uh, as so as Messiah. And it it doesn't seem to um, be concerned with what the meaning of Messiah might be. I mean, this is a major statement in the context of Jewish Christian conversation to call Jesus Messiah. Um, also, the fact that Jesus is called Asa, uh, that name is really interesting and all sorts of debates over the origin of Asa. It's not what you'd expect from Semitic languages, um, where the first consonant instead is at the end. Uh, Yeshua in Christian Arabic is his name. So, um, I mean, I, I think there are signs of sort of the historical context that could be seen and not only with the figure of Jesus, but with other elements of, of the Quran.